Hello and welcome to another episode of At Home Physics, where today we're going to more or less prove that this formula is valid. t is equal to 2 pi times the square root of life is good. Now, how do we know that this is true? I mean, there are mathematical derivations, but you probably want to prove it by doing a simple experiment, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to let a pendulum pendulate and eventually prove that this formula is true. But before we get there, we need to know about something with regards to logarithms. As a reminder, what a logarithm is, is that it's a method of trying to find out the exponent that will get you to your answer. For example, if you do the log of 1,000, effectively you're trying to ask for, well, 10 to the power of what will give you 1,000. Right, so that's what you're trying to look for. Um, now with logarithms, often you assume that's base 10, but you can also assume other bases as well. But on your calculator, 10 is the default number. So 10 to the power of what will give you 1,000. Many of you guys will, will know that, that 1,000 is equal to 10 times 10 times 10. So 10 to the 3 will give you 1,000. And that's why when you pull out your calculator and you do um, the log of 1,000, yes, you are going to get the answer of 3. Now, from a more mathematical approach, what you'll do next in this problem here is that you'll do 1,000 represented by a base of 10 to the 3. And as long as these two bases match up, you can take the exponent and bring it outside. It's one of those properties of logarithms. So you could take the 3 outside and the log base 10 of 10, well, that goes to 1, and 3 times 1 will give you 3. Long-winded way of getting to the answer, but I just want to show you that that arithmetic property does exist with logarithms. Another interesting thing is that if you ever do a logarithm of a value less than 1, you will arrive to a negative answer. How does that work out? Well, if you take 1 over 1,000, that has the same meaning as 1 times 10 to the power of 3. And anytime you have an inverse, all you're doing is doing a negative, so it's effectively 10 to the negative 3. And that's what we're placing uh, inside the brackets for the logarithm. Again, one of those uh, arithmetic properties of logarithms is that as long as the base are the same, you can take the exponent and bring it to the outside. So we're bringing the negative 3 to the outside, and that's why the answer will be negative 3. Now this works all fine and dandy with you know numbers that are nice and clean like these examples here, but how would you deal with a number like this? The log of you know 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, we know that the log of 1,000 is roughly 3, so the log of 1, 2, 3, 4 is probably 3 point you know, some number. And that's why we want to pull out our calculator and let that figure out all the complexities for us. So the log of 1, 2, 3, 4 gives you 3.09. What that means is that 10 to the power of 3.09 is going to be roughly equal to 1, 2, 3, 4 when you try it out the other way around. All right, so 10 to the power of 3.09 should give you roughly 1, 2, 3, 4. You can see that we get 1, 2, 3, 0. And that has to do with the fact that this number over here is 3 sig fig, so we can't expect an answer over here to be you know, more certain than 3 sig fig. There's going to be some rounding error there. OK, so just to describe these properties, this is one of them. Again, as long as you have the base matched up, you can take the exponent and put it on the outside. Another interesting property about logarithms is that any value they have inside the logarithm, if they are a product of two numbers, you could technically isolate them and add them separately outside, and you'll get the same exact answer. You can also do the same thing with subtraction, or sorry, with division as well. So if you divide a by b, it's kind of like taking the value of a and logging it, and then taking the log of b and then subtracting the two. You'll get to the same exact answer. In fact, this is the life hack of how we used to do calculations back in the good old days when we didn't have scientific calculators. Instead, we have pieces of plastic all lined up on top of each other. And yeah, this thing over here is called a good old slide rule for a slide ruler. So again, the inside piece can move left and right. You have another vertical indicator that can also move to the left and right. And with a gizmo like this, you can easily add, subtract, multiply, divide. And in some of the fancier models, you can also do uh, sine, cosine, and tangent. And this will be quite certain to roughly 2 to 3 sig fig. And if 2 to 3 sig fig isn't good enough for you because you wanted 3 or 4 sig fig, then just take a slide rule that can lie on a round, like a big one like this one, about the size of a human being. 
Okay, and this was how it was done back in the 1960s and 70s, uh, when scientific calculators were, you know, in the thousands of dollars. So it really wasn't affordable for a high school student to, to, you know, bring one of those to school. So they had these pieces of plastic that slid back and forth. Anyways, we need to use uh, a traditional technique using logarithms in trying to find out that yes, it is true that t is equal to two pi times uh, the root of l over g. All right, so let's get to that. Oh, oh yeah, one more thing. Yeah, there are some fancy watches where if you notice that the numbers are not linear on the outside, that's because they had a slide rule and they made it into a nice cute little circle. Okay, so this is a special type of paper. It's called log-log paper because if you look in the y dimension, it's been logarithmed as well as in the x dimension, right? In a normal piece of paper, you'll have, you know, the units of one, two, three, four, five, but you can see that this uh, over here uh, is, uh, growing quite significantly. In fact, every time you sh shift over by one major grid division, you're effectively multiplying by 10 times, each and every single time. Okay, so let's say they had a correlation that, you know, y is equal to x. So in other words, if y is equal to three, sorry, if x is equal to three, then y is equal to three. If x is equal to five, then y is equal to five. And you can see that this is true here, right? Okay, now again, even though this is log paper, if you look at it from a linear perspective, so you're not looking at these weird uh, divisions where they seem to you know, get closer together because that's the nature of logarithm, and you look at the bigger overall grid, you'll see that this guy over here has a slope that's equal to one. Effectively, y is equal to x to the power of one. Well, what if you have something that's quadratic now? Like for example, y is equal to x squared. Now on a linear graph paper, you're probably gonna have something that looks like this. But on a logarithmic graph paper, you'll have something that looks more like this. So that's one of the interesting things about logarithmic paper. It doesn't care about you know whether if you're you know linear, quadratic, cubic, a uh, square root correlation. It's going to convert everything into a line. And your objective really is just to find the slope of the line compared to the major grid divisions. And you'll see that in this setup over here, you have a major grid division of two over one, and two over one is equal to two. And that's effectively what you'll see over here. Okay, here's another one. What about y to the power of one half? Well, now you'll have a line where the slope isn't as steep as it was before. And if you look at the major grid division lines, you'll see you'll have a rise of one and a run of two. Exactly what you'd expect right over here. Here's one more. Okay, here's a random example and you plotted all your data and this is the correlation that you see. Again, you're comparing everything from the major grid division. So if you need to extrapolate the line, then by all means, and extrapolate it. And you'll see that in this setup over here, I don't think I drew my line perfectly, but it's definitely gonna be less than um, a linear correlation, right? Because a linear correlation will have a one-to-one -one ratio. It's definitely more than a square root. So it's gonna be somewhere between a square root and a whole. And in this case over here, it does work out to, uh, if you look at it, I think right over here is a good point. You have a rise of two and a run of three. All right, so it's a two to three correlation. And if you look up here, that is true. After all, if y is equal to three over uh, x over two, then y is equal to x of two thirds. So that is true. Right. Now, not all of us have this special type of paper, so we kind of have to do a, a hack for it. Instead of using this logarithmic paper, how about we take our numbers and then we log it? Because once we log the numbers, then we effectively have linear paper where the numbers have been pre-logged. And in fact, that is a hack of how you do uh, the lab today. All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your values, one in the y dimension and one in the x dimension, and you're going to log it. So you can take the data and you're going to log it over. That way you can avoid uh, purchasing this rare um, log paper. I suppose you could use Excel to print out a blank one and work through it, but again, this is a hack where you can just use linear paper and still get to the same results because you're pre-logging your data. Right? So you're taking your values and you're logging it so that when you measure the slope on the graph, that slope will tell you what type of correlation it is. All right. So if you have a slope that's equal to one, well, that will be considered as a linear correlation. If you have a slope that's equal to two, 
then you know that the relationship is quadratic. If the relationship is, for example, 0.67, then yeah, it's some sort of power relation. And if you have one that's exactly one half, then you know it's a root two correlation. All right, so the slope is equal to one half, you know it's a square root correlation. After all, if you say that y is equal to uh, the square root of x, then y is also equal to x to the one half. It's another way of representing the same exact measurement. Okay, so uh, I'll just show you the lab instructions and then I'll let you off to the races. So when you do, a, when you play with a pendulum, uh, one of the problems is that when you let it pendulate, it may end up orbiting because you didn't release it very well. All right, so as it swings back and forth, it just starts going around in a circle. And you will try your best to make it swing in just one dimension. One good hack to make it possible, especially if you're doing this lab by yourself, is to just take two dining room tables, place them ten to end. All right, then you'll attach a string from the tops of both chairs. Then you place a mass, and with that mass, it's going to go off and make everything nice and clean now. All right, instead of having that uh, curve, which is known as a catenary, now you have something that looks more like this with your mass. You're going to let the mass pendulate backwards and forwards relative to the two chairs on the side, and that way this can be a one-person job. One thing I do want to point out is how you're measuring the length of the string. I think many of you will accidentally measure this as a length, but really you're looking at the length of a pendulum. And since it's going to pendulate along in this dimension over here, this is the proper length of the string. All right, so you probably want to place a flat object all the way across, and then take your ruler and measure the drop. All right. And to minimize this complication, you probably want to place your chairs relatively close to each other. Because right? the closer you place it, um, the easier it is to measure the height that I was talking about. Okay? This is your proper L. And you have a mass hanging over here. Now when you let it pendulate, you don't want to let it move just once and start and stop the watch. Because if you do, the general reaction time of a human being is somewhere in the realms of plus minus 0.2 seconds. So for example, if it goes through a period of one second, well, one second with an error of 0.2 seconds is effectively one second with a 20% error. All right, that's a huge error, and it's going to be hard for you to confirm whether your results are valid and true with a 20% error. So there is a cool hack in making it possible that you can reduce your error without having to improve on your hand reaction time. And that's by letting the oscillations not happen just once, but letting it happen, for example, 10 or 20 times. For example, if you let it pendulate and you end up getting an answer of, I don't know, let's say 12.3 uh, seconds. All right. Again, that's uh, a period of 10 times more than what's necessary. Now, with your hand reaction time, it's still going to be the same of 0.2 seconds. However, this 0.2 seconds is now distributing the error amongst 10 trials. So when you reduce it down to the period just for one event, well, 12.3 will reduce down to 1.23 seconds, and your error will also reduce. All right, because you're dividing by 10, now your error is plus minus 0.02 seconds. So this is a cool way to improve the certainty and precision of your measurements by allowing the experiment not to happen once, but multiple times. All right, so 10 is probably the minimum you want to aim for, but if you want to improve your error, with your uncertainty, you probably want to oscillate as many as 20 times to make that happen. All right, so that's the first thing you're going to do. You're going to set up your chairs in a V-shaped configuration and let it pendulate more than just once. Let it happen a few times. Another recommendation is that when you let it pe to pendulate, you probably don't want to use uh, the lowest point as your reference timing, uh, because unless if it's physically there, you're not going to time it perfectly. Instead, while it's pendulating, you'll let it reach up to its highest point and then that's where you take your start stopwatch and then you start it at its maximum height. Then you're going to let it go back and then you can already anticipate when it's going to stop. So by the time you hit your 10 or 20 oscillations, you know when to press the stop button on your stopwatch and you'll have a relatively um, reliable measurement. Okay, so for step three, I'm asking you to just keep the system exactly the same. All right, so with the same exact chairs and the string of the same exact length, start adding more things to the pendulum. One thing that you shouldn't do is adding to the pendulum further down below, because if you do, you're changing now your overall length, because the length should be measured from the center of mass. Okay, so you want to attach everything so that they're all in the same exact length spot. 
and this part over here, I just want you to try it out to prove to yourself that, you know, when you look at the formula, t is equal to 2 pi over life is good, you'll see that there's no m here, thus proving that mass, well, think about it, does it have an effect really on your answer? That's, that's the purpose of step three. Okay. Now, as for what I'm analyzing and uh, what I want you to discuss about afterwards from your collected data is this part over here. What you're going to do is that you'll have a system where you can take the string and you can allow it to relax a little bit more or probably you want to stretch it so that now you have different lengths. All right, so you'll be starting off with a shorter length and then increasing it and then making it even longer. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the correlation between the length of the string versus the period. And that's what you're trying to plot out, okay? A log of the period versus pendulum length graph. And as you may recall, if you log everything, the slope of it will tell you what the correlation is. Okay? And that's effectively what your lab is. You're trying to prove that the relationship between period and length is denoted by this correlation over here. Hope you can see that. Okay. Now, when you're working through your lab, uh, you might notice that there are going to be other uh, erroneous values. And that has to do with the fact that, not erroneous, but just outside values. It has to do with the fact that when you plot out your graph, it won't necessarily look like this. It will more likely look like this. In other words, you're going to have some sort of vertical offset. Right? And that vertical offset is important because it does, it does correlate with your measurements. After all, you're not looking at a value where it's directly correlated. All right? Uh, for example, like y is equal to the square root of x. Instead, you're going to have something like this. y is equal to a times the square root of x. Right. So this coefficient over here will denote this offset over here. Just remember that you've already logged it. So what you need to do is you need to do the inverse log. So for example, if you have a value of, let's say, 3 for your vertical offset, well, then you'll want to do 10 to the power of 3. And then that will tell you what the coefficient is. And that's what I'm getting at with regards to this whole mess over here. Okay, the, the n tells you the exponent, but the vertical offset, if you do the inverse log of it, that will tell you the coefficient. So please tell me how that coefficient falls into the whole gameplay as well. And that is your lab. Best of luck, and I'll leave the instructions for you for those that want to screen capture this.